Hi, I'm Semben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Improved Intuitive Average Model of PCM Converters, that is, peak current mode converters. So why would we like to have average models? Well, average models, when properly developed, are compatible with AC analysis, PICE, or any other circuit simulator. So they can be used to get transfer function of the converter itself and the loop gain if the compensator is designed. So it is a very, very useful tool to simplify examination and actually design of control loops in power converters. Let me go briefly about the operation of a peak current mode. I'm showing here a generic representation. We have the clock, which is setting a flip-flop and then causing the gate to go up. And the current then increases as the current reaches the reference level. Let's call it V sub E. Then through this comparator, the flip-flop is reset and the voltage of the gate is going down. So what happens is really that the inductor current is going up and then when the peak of the inductor current, that is with the ripple, is reaching V sub E, then the, the gate is turned off. So if V sub E is changing, let's say by a step like this, the peak of the inductor current will sort of follow it. So this is the basic operation of peak current mode. Now in a real system, we have a, an external loop, as it is called, that is we have an internal current loop, and then we have an external loop in which we sense the output or part of the output, compare it to a reference, then we might have here phase compensation, and the output of this amplifier is now this V sub E that the current is following. Now this control method has many, many benefits. Uh, one of them is that it has a, what the so-called cycle by cycle current protection. But another important aspect is that now we are actually removing the inductor and replacing it by a current source because now the current in this branch is following V sub E. So in fact, we are reducing the order of the system from a second order, that is the inductor plus the output capacitor, to a first order, just the current source and a capacitor, or at high frequency, it'll be the ESR of the capacitor. So this is very beneficial because it simplifies the control, make it more robust, and it's less sensitive to variation like a change in a capacitor, and I'm going to demonstrate this later. However, the current really does not follow vis -B. The peak current is following, and there is a difference. And the average current, of course, is here midway. Not only that, if the operation is with a duty cycle above 0.5, then we need slope compensation. So therefore, we have now a slope here, which is the original inductor plus the slope compensation. And then the distance between V sub E and the average current is even farther away. Now in this approach that I'm presenting here, I'm actually accounting for this difference and implementing it in an average model. So here is how it is done. Here is the V sub E, this is the average, and we have to find actually the difference so I can subtract it from VE and this will be actually the current. So to do that, I have to find this distance now this slope is the combined slope of the inductor plus the slope which is given and then I can subtract this length and then add to it half of the ripple. And these are the expression related to it. I can find the ripple from V in minus V out over L. This is the slope of the inductor current. And then I can find T on from V out over V in times T S. So this is done on the run while the simulation will be running. So let me repeat. First of all, we find this distance here, and then we add to it half of the inductor current ripple, and this will be the distance between V sub E and the average current. And here is the implementation. Let me first of all talk about the average model, okay? Just to make it clear, I've broken all the calculation into the individual parts, it's not necessary, but just for the sake of uh, understanding it better. Here I'm generating the slope, okay? It's 200 millivolt uh, height over the period of uh, three microseconds. So it's a 
333 kilohertz switching frequency. And then I am calculating T on from V out over V in times the duration of the switching cycle. And then this is the actual distance of this uh, slope, the slope times time. And then I have here the inductor current ripple. And finally, I have the current source, which is the reference minus these two terms. And this goes into the output. Now I've added here a current source with a step such that we can see the step response of this unit. It will start 5 milliseconds after time 0, and it is 0.1 amp. And now I have here a full-fledged model of a switched peak armament mode. I have here the flip-flop. This is the comparator. This is the inductor current plus the slope. And then I have here the reference. The reference that I have here at this point is some DC plus an AC superimposed of 200 millivolt. So I can see the transfer in large signal between the reference and the output. Now in this case, of course, I have the inductor because I'm using it to measure the inductor current. And then we have at the output a capacitor plus an ESR. And then there's another load here. And we have here the same current source for the load response. And here is a typical response. What I'm showing here is a step response in the load. And of course, there is no feedback. So therefore, the voltage is dropping. And I have here the modulation. In this case, it's a 10 kilohertz. This is the signal injected at the reference. And what we see here are the two outputs. The red one, which is not seen because it is behind the green one is the switched system while the green one is the average system and you can see that it's exactly the same i mean there's just no difference well there's something here but basically we see exactly the same response so we see that the average model is really really very good in duplicating the behavior of the switch peak current mode circuit and here it's a closed up what we see here is we see the output, the green one is the average, the red one is the switched. Well, there is a small difference, but you see the difference here between the two edges here is like 1.6 millivolt. So this difference is like 10 millivolt or something like that. And we see here the inductor current with the modulation. And what we see here is the inductor current plus the slope. And, and on the top of it, is the reference. We don't see it very well, but what it happens is that this uh, combined slope is reaching this reference, and then, of course, the flip-flop is turned off. So it works very nice as a switched unit, and what is also nice is that the average model is really following very nice. Now, if I go to 33 kilohertz, we can see already that the sampling is not very good because we're talking about 333, it's one-tenth of the switching frequency, the signal, okay? So it is something missing a little bit here, you can see that. And as a result, we see here, the amplitude is the same for the average and the switched, but there is a slight phase shift, which is caused, I think, by the sampling. So the sampling is actually introducing some displacement here because of the delay in the sampling. And other than that, the amplitude is pretty good. The question is, of course, which one is the correct one for stability? Well, it's a, it's a fine question. We didn't see it at the 10 kilohertz. This is exactly the same, but at 33 kilohertz, 110, it's already seen some phase shift. And then I go to 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz is very high. You have only three samples per cycle. And you can see it here, evident here, it's very corrupted, it's uh, sampling here. Since it's not a round ratio, then uh, we see that the sampling is uh, sort of uh, running all over the place. Sometimes it's here, sometimes it's there, and as a result, we see the inductor current jumping all over the place. And of course, voltage ripple is following this change in the current. Now, if I increase the signal to actually 300 kilohertz, that's above the Nyquist, which is half of the 333 kilohertz. We are much, much above it. What we see here, that the sampling is missing the signal, and consequently, the inductor current is running all the way, although it is sort of periodical. 
and the frequency here is 33 kilohertz. Well, it really makes sense because what we see here really a demonstration of what is called folding, okay? Because we are, the difference is 33 kilohertz, we have folding to the lower frequency, we get now a signal of 33 kilohertz, which is very, very nice, uh, demonstrated here in this uh, simulation. So what we see is that the switched system, of course, suffers from the problem of sampling. However, the average model is transparent to sampling, so therefore it keeps giving us output as if everything is okay, like the switching frequency is, I don't know, gigahertz or whatever. So one has to realize that you cannot rely on the average model as the frequency is getting to the Nyquist limit. So as I've said, the main advantages of an average model that you can run AC simulation. And I'm showing now the transfer ratio between the output and the excitation. And we see here indeed a typical first order response plus a zero here, which is due to the ESR. That is at high frequency, the impedance of the capacitor becomes smaller than the impedance of the resistance of the ESR. And consequently, we have now a current source feeding a resistor. So the response should be flat and the phase should be zero. And that indeed what we see, the response is flat and the phase is really getting back to zero degrees. Very, very nice. Now we can do a sanity check to compare the AC response to the time domain simulation. So what I'm doing now, I'm looking at the point of 10 kilohertz and looking at the gain at this 10 kilohertz between the excitation and the output. And I see it's uh, minus uh, 9.5 dB, which is like 0.33. On the other hand, if I look now at the time domain simulation, the excitation is 400 millivolt peak to peak. The output is 135 millivolt peak to peak. And indeed, the ratio is 0.33. Very, very accurate, very, very nice. However, let's not forget that as we go to a higher frequency that is more than the 10K, then the signal is okay, but then we have some phase shift, which is sort of the deviation between the switched unit and the average unit. Now, once you have an average model, you can examine very cases. For example, I'm showing here what happens if the ESR of the capacitor is changing. What we see is that as the resistance ESR is getting higher, then the zero is getting at a lower, lower frequency. And the same thing you can do with the change in capacitor. We see the pole here is changing at 100 microfarads and the pole is low frequency and 10 microfarads, it seems to be like here. And this of course has to be taken into account when designing the control of the unit, the phase compensation, just to make sure that with all expected variation due to safe aging, you are you know, on the safe side. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.